All right, so what I'd like to do now is begin the discussion of why do we need completable futures. I've given you a really, really high level overview of what completable futures are, but really gave you no particular details about them. This will also not give you a whole lot of details about them, but it'll at least explain why they're necessary. So we'll talk about the pros and cons of synchrony and asynchrony. So I think as we've talked about many times, and as you should certainly have experience from earlier work that you've done, earlier classes, earlier projects, method calls in your classic Java programs are largely synchronous. So examples would be you know, making method calls on Java collections, the behaviors in a Java 8 stream, be it synchronous or asynchronous, or sorry, be it parallel or, or sequential, those are all examples of things that are synchronous. And what that means is the callee, the thing it's called, borrows the thread of control of the caller until the computations are finished. So again, just think about a normal method call. That's exactly what happens. So you can see here, you know, we make calls and we get results back. So the callee borrows the thread of control of the caller, does the work, gives the result back. There are pros and cons to this kind of an approach. So the good news is we've all done it forever, so it's really intuitive. It doesn't take a lot of deep thinking to get it right, because that's the way we've learned how to program. It maps nicely onto these conventional, common two-way method call patterns of request response. And local caller state is retained in the activation record of the caller so that when the callee returns, the state is immediately available. Here's a very simple example of this. This is a method that's going to download the contents at a URL and return an array of bytes as the result. And you'll notice that you know, here it's going to make a bunch of method calls, like read and write, and it'll make those calls in a loop. But all the state, like buff, output stream, input stream, all of those things, bytes, for example, these things all retain their values across calls to these functions, like read and write. So it makes the code really easy to write, really easy to reason about. When control comes back to you from calling read or write, your current local state is just where you left it, and that's good, because you don't have to think too hard about it. There are some downsides, however. First thing, sequential or synchronous approaches, even if they're parallel, may not leverage all the parallelism that's available in a modern multi-core system. Uh, in particular, whenever you start blocking threads, there's overhead incurred. So there's synchronization, content switching, data movement, memory management, costs, and so on. I kind of outlined those before. And uh, I love this. This, uh, <laughs> this is a great visualization of this point. So you know, this is the idea of having everything sort of running in parallel, right? That's the theory. And then this is the practice, right? So things start competing and, and contending and overlapping and corrupting, and it, it gets pretty crazy pretty fast. So that's the problem with using the blocking threads. Another problem is that selecting the right number of threads in a synchronous program is tricky. And that's because you have to make this trade-off between too many or too few. So here's a little snippet of code. This is something we looked at earlier. This is the image stream gang example, where we've got the parallel stream, and it's doing the downloading and so on. And here's the download image call. And the question is, how many threads do we want to have in the pool? And how do we select what that should be? So if you pick two many threads, then you're wasting performance because you've got all these threads that are idle in the pool, chewing up virtual memory and slots in the processor uh, table and so on that the OS manages. So that might be inefficient from a resource point of view. But if you have too few threads to get efficient resource utilization, you may end up making things run slower. You may have deadlock. There's all these other problems. So picking the right number is hard, as we've discussed before. Particularly hard, as we discussed, picking the right number of threads for I.O. bound processes or tasks, programs. Because they, as you remember, typically need more threads in order to block properly because you need to have other work done. And making the programmer, application programmer, responsible for figuring these things out is not an easy thing. Um, so as a result, for the parallel streams model, you have to do all this programming. You have to either pick the right number of threads using a system property, or you have to use managed blockers, or you have to do something, and it gets to be tricky really fast. So conversely, what do we get with asynchronous approaches? Well, asynchronous approaches, when done properly, can alleviate a lot of the limitations with the synchronous approaches we talked about. So if you recall, asynchrony is a model of concurrent programming, or, or parallel programming, really, where the unit of work, the task, or the computation, has certain types of properties. 
So one property is that you can have it run separately from the calling thread in the background. So some you can have a background thread or background threads that are doing processing independently of anything that's interacting with the user interface. And that's the way, of course, modern smartphone architectures like Android and iOS work. So something can be taking place in the background. And then at some point, as things either succeed or fail, or you just want to give a progress update, you can notify some UI thread that something's happened. So that's really what asynchronous is, processing is about. You've got something running in the background, and when it's done, it can notify somebody who may have spawned it or may be interested in knowing what the results are. This approach has pros and cons, too, just like everything else. So some of the pros are the system is more responsive because the threads aren't blocking. The user application threads don't block. They, they can do whatever they want, and then stuff runs in the background and then communicates progress, success, failure, and so on. And the other nice thing is we get elasticity. So if you have a pool in the background, especially a pool that can auto expand and contract the way that a fork join pool can do with a managed blocker or a cached thread pool can do by just its very nature, then you can kind of auto scale and make things work in a more transparent and scalable way. There are, of course, some downsides. One downside with asynchronous calls is their unpredictability. So you may be more responsive, but it also may not be clear how long something's going to take to run. When you launch it, you don't know how long it's going to take to give you an answer back. And the results may occur in a different order than the original calls were made. So sometimes you don't really care. Other times you really do care, because it's easy to get confused if things come back in the wrong order. Another trick, tricky thing, because of the fact that things are unpredictable and occurring in different orders, debugging can be harder. It's hard to figure out where to set breakpoints. It's hard to figure out why your program is behaving in a certain way. When you run your program in the debugger, the behavior may be different than if you run the program outside the debugger because the timing properties may, may differ. So debugging can be a lot harder with an asynchronous program. Debugging is already hard enough with a parallel program, but when you start cross-cutting that with asynchrony, it can be even more tricky. So there's a nice article here that talks about some techniques you might try to use to improve debugging of asynchronous and parallel programs, or multi-threaded programs. So you might want to take a look at that for some tips if you run into problems for the assignments. OK, so that's just kind of an overview. I still haven't really given you any details about completable futures. And when we come back on Wednesday, we will go into much more detail getting piece by piece into what the API does and how to use it effectively.